still be an asshole? <laughs> you comic? No, this is just something I'm working on. Uh, aren't we all working on something? Fredo. Huh? Ask for Miss Clue. Do you want me to look like a corpse up here? Yeah, I'll pretend I care. You're violent, right? Is this your show? Yeah, it's my show. I'm a booker. Well, you're Bob Divorce's assistant. So you booked too late, right? That job is your whole life. It's not so bad. He's never gonna let you go. Value yourself by. There's more to life than, oh, than a boss who only lets you peek inside the party but never invites you in. Lyle, don't forget. Dark of the moon. Why are you booking but not performing? You know, I think we all start out with what we think we want to be. But we end up just being what we are. I don't have any material on that, so it's not ideal. I've been patient with you, Violet. I can make things happen for you, but only if you do your job. No. I've just never met anybody like you before. Can I tell you something? Yeah. I don't believe you. Violet, both you and I know that comedians aren't really people. The prophecy has been fulfilled! Showtime. Don't make him mad, right? I mean, if Bob's not happy, nobody's happy. <laughs>
Wait, did you guys know you can do a bunch of yoga and still be an asshole? You comic? No, this is just something I'm working on. Oh, aren't we all working on something? Fredo. Huh? I asked for a Miss Blue. You want me to look like a corpse up here? Yeah, I'll pretend I care. You're violent, right? Is this your show? Yeah, it's my show. I'm a booker. Well, you're Bob Divorce's assistant. You've looked too late, right? That job is your whole life. It's not so bad. He's never gonna let you go. Value yourself, Vi. There's more to life than... Oh, than a boss who only lets you peek inside the party but never invites you in. Violet, don't forget. Dark of the moon. Why are you booking but not performing? You know, I think we all start out with what we think we want to be. And we end up just being what we are. I don't have any material on that, so that's not ideal. I've been patient with you, Violet. I can make things happen for you, but only if you do your job. I just never met anybody like you before. Can I tell you something? I don't believe you. Violet, both you and I know that comedians aren't really people. The prophecy has been fulfilled! Showtime. Don't make him mad, right? I mean, if Bob's not happy, nobody's happy. <laughs>
Hey, did you guys know you can do a bunch of yoga and still be an asshole? You comic? No, this is just something I'm working on. Mm, aren't we all working on something? Fredo. Huh? That's from Miss Blue. You want me to look like a corpse up here? Yeah, I'll pretend I care. You're violent, right? Is this your show? Yeah, it's my show. I'm a booker. Well, you're Bob Divorce's assistant. So you look too late, right? That job is your whole life. It's not so bad. He's never gonna let you go. Value yourself by. There's more to life than, oh, than a boss who only lets you peek inside the party but never invites you in. Violet, don't forget. Dark of the moon. Why are you booking but not performing? You know, I think we all start out with what we think we want to be. But we end up just being what we are. I don't have any material on that, so it's not ideal. I've been patient with you, Violet. I can make things happen for you, but only if you do your job. I just never met anybody like you before. Can I tell you something? I don't believe you. Violet, both you and I know that comedians aren't really people. The prophecy has been fulfilled! Showtime. Don't make him mad, right? I mean, if Bob's not happy, nobody's happy. <laughs>
pandemic, we're turning a corner, opening up again, but still, let's be real, it's stressful times. And a movie like Too Late is the perfect horror comedy antidote. Anti Either way, it's perfect for the times we're living in. Let me tell you who I am, Josh Milliken from Dread Central. Let me tell you who we are here with. Uh, we're here with the director of Too Late, D.W. Thomas. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Yes, yes. We are here with the production designer of Too Late, uh, Sam Slosberg. Welcome, Sam. We are here with the composer who brought us the wonderful soundscape of Too Late, uh, Michael Hurwitz. Welcome, Michael, at your magic piano. Uh, really stoked to have the film's two leads here. Uh, we've got Alyssa Lumperis, uh, who plays Vi, uh, Violet, but Vi to her friends. Which you are, late. which you are, so oh, yes. <laughs> thank you so much. And Ron Lynch, who plays Bob DeVore, a uh, monstrous boss. Uh, you think your boss is a monster. Uh, your boss ain't got nothing on Bob. <laughs> Welcome to you all. Uh, I'm truly, uh, uh, sincerely happy to have you all here. Um, done a lot of these panels now over the past year or so. And uh, my favorite ones are the ones where I genuinely enjoyed and loved uh, the film that we're talking about. And that's the case for Too Late. Kind of came out of nowhere you know I, i'm a horror guy i'm steeped into the horror universe you know i see all the the big horror things and as many of the indie things as i can and uh this one just really blew my mind because uh, i wasn't expecting something so pleasing uh that's also really dark and uh <laughs> gross and just a ton of fun so you know if you haven't seen too late yet really can't encourage you enough to check it out it's worth your time it's worth your money uh, it's a really fun watch that i was just so delighted to absorb and uh hence i've just really been looking forward to meeting with y'all and talking about the film uh, let's kick things off by talking to the director first dw uh, tell me a little bit about yourself you're, you're uh, not a lot of information about you online i was trying to do some research but you know you're, you're kind of a mystery yeah, I I came out of nowhere. Well, actually, I was in post production for the last twenty years, so that's pretty much nowhere. We we stay hidden away in a dark room, and I've been editing. Um, and so my husband and I we came together and we were like, we we're never going to get the opportunity to direct something unless we do it ourselves. And so we came up with this low budget concept and Tom, uh, he was in the comedy scene for a while doing stand up, and he knew Ron and we were like, oh, let's, what, we wanna write something about Ron. And so, yeah, so that's sort of how that came about, how we ended up making this film about the comedy scene. And uh, I, I am a huge fan of creature features, I love, Gremlins, I love American Werewolf in London, and I just love that you can mix comedy with monsters and not have it be super, super horror and super, super bloody and like scary. I like kind of the more fun side of things. And so that was, that was a big part of when we decided to make it set in this comedy scene because we knew that we had a lot of connection to comedians and that we could make it feel really real and also dark and and funny so yeah that's how that came about and where we came from I guess well it, it you know I said this during our tech check to y'all it, it felt so authentic you know it felt like an actual window into the Los Angeles comedy scene and very much a product of that comedy scene you know uh, I, I've, I've, you know, did open mics, spoken word. I've been in bands, but I, I've never really been in the LA comedy scene. Is that really kind of, is this a somewhat accurate window into yeah. what someone's going to experience if they want to be a comedian in LA? <laughs> Definitely. Even with the monster aspect. But, it, but we actually have been getting that as a reaction from a lot of comedians, especially. They're saying, wow, this movie... 
uh, sort of paints the comedy scene better than anything they've seen, you know, aside from the monster aspect, but. No, not aside, it, from, not aside from the monster aspect, uh -huh. that included. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Alyssa, but, let me pivot over to you. Your character, Vi, uh, in addition to being Bob's assistant, uh, you know, she runs her own uh, comedy uh, open mic night. I, I mean, is that something you actually had experience in, either, either either as a producer or you know someone learning the ropes? I did, yeah. I started as a stand-up, so I moved to New York right out of college, and I ran this mic at Art Cafe, and I would run it every week. And some of the worst comedy you'd ever seen <laughs> from me and others, you know, it was just a really fun place where it was like really like we were all finding our voices and that's how I started was just like open mic at, yeah middle of the day hosting it and yeah and, right on right yeah. on well Ron uh, your character Bob also uh hosts and produces um a, a comedy uh a night uh you know you kind of set up you know as as you know uh, it's such an interesting relationship you, uh, between Bob and Violet, you know, she's his employee, but they're also kind of uh, competing, you know, because uh, they're, they're doing the same thing, working towards the same aspirations. But uh, you, you do run uh, a comedy night here in Los Angeles? Uh, yeah, well, it's been on Instagram recently and the theater we were going to go back to isn't necessarily going to even open again. So I'm looking for a theater now. But uh, yeah, we did a we did a midnight show for probably... Uh, uh, well, for 13 years at midnight, and then it changed a little bit when we moved to the third theater. Uh, but yeah, we've been doing a show for 16 years now. Um, I like to say it's a variety show. Occasionally we have a lot of stand up, but it's all kinds of acts. Anything goes, and anything anybody can do whatever they want. And it's um, called? It, it's called Tomorrow! Exclamation um, point. Nice. Everyone calls it the Tomorrow Show, but I stayed away from that because there was an old show for, but with Tom Snyder as a host called the Tomorrow Show. So I felt bad doing that for some reason. But yeah, it's called Tomorrow. Midnight, get it? Midnight, tomorrow. All right. Um, Got it. So the 11 o'clock show, we would just take it to midnight and then announce tomorrow, right? That would be cool. Right, right. Uh, so this is something that, that you're doing online now? Yeah, it's on Instagram now. Uh, at Ron Lynch one, uh, and uh, we're dying to get back live, of course, but it's very convenient not leaving the house. <laughs> yeah, as illustrated uh, by the five of us, six of us being here. Very uh, true, very true. Yeah. Well, that's really interesting. You know, I definitely want to circle back around a little bit and just talk about you know what what the comedy scene has endured these past uh, eighteen months or so. But I, I, I want to get over to Sam. Uh, yeah something I read about you that kind of like struck a chord for me personally. Uh, you recently moved from uh, Los Angeles to Arizona to start an entrepreneurial endeavor. You want to tell our, our viewers a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I was doing production design in LA for like the past six years and then um, sort of ended up kind of when everything shut down with COVID, I kind of like sidestepped over my dad and sister actually kind of were the ones who launched tried started launching this company um and i they needed somebody to production design it so i kind of helped with the packaging and you know the logo and like the branding of it um while i had no work to do and now all of a sudden i live in arizona and that's crazy but um it's not, I'm like, you can probably see I'm like sweating here still. So yeah, like, I don't think you described the, the product. It's, um, so I'm like, I, maybe much to your disappointment, it's actually, it's Delta 8 THC, which is a little different than regular THC. How so? It's, it's a more mild psychoactive high that's engaging with different receptors in your body. So you're getting more of a body high, a little uh, less of a head high, but you still get like a little of the euphoria. But really we see a lot of people who are using it for, the pain management and the anti-nausea properties. Um, well, those are those are great things, and that that uh, makes it a uh, uh, very uh, uh, good work that you're doing. But you know, nothing wrong with the mild body highs either. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if you can tell by looking at me, but I, I smoke cannabis time to time. <laughs> <laughs> 
I might. You know, uh, you might not know it by looking at I me, wasn't actually. sold on you, but then when I saw the 16 lava lamps, I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I put two and two together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, yeah, I, I had a show. I had a show called Chronic Horror where I would uh, get folks uh, on set and uh, get them nice and stoned and then serve them lunchies. And then we'd watch a horror movie together while, while nice and high. And then, you know, um, COVID-19 pandemic came along and ruined all that, you know, um, sharing a, a pipe, being close proximity, breathing all over each other, and then putting your same hands in food. All those were big no-nos and, you know, you guys know the rest of the story because it happened to y'all. Uh, Mike, what's going on, man? Uh, I'm really loving the um, banjo in the background. And uh, you were telling me in the tech check that that's actually on the soundtrack. Uh, it is, yeah. The banjo right behind us here. Uh, well, you know, uh, I've been talking about how Too Late is a really... Um, <laughs> lost my train of thought. No, no reason for that. Too Late is a really unique film. And therefore... Uh, uh, as a, a composer, it must have offered some unique challenges and opportunities for creativity. Let's yeah. discuss. Yeah, sure, yeah. Um, I mean, I've never really scored a film like this before. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not like, like a deep horror guy. So it was a real like departure from, I guess, my, my, um, my worldview, I guess, to, to, to jump in and score something like this. And it, it was sort of an opportunity to bring a bunch of different elements in. Um, I kind of come more from comedy. So I saw this as like a comedy superimposed over a, over a horror film instead of the other oh. way around. Um, and yes, yeah, so we brought in elements like the banjo and the harpsichord for Bob, like Bob's character. Um, and it was sort of lent itself to this like weird quirkiness that sort of fit with Bob's like timelessness or like, you know he's he's from this different era so that i think that helped kind of tie tie that backstory that we never fully learn but you know i, I think maybe the music helps in, in telling a little bit of what's not on i love the accordion stuff the accordion stuff's great thanks yeah it's uh it was cool i mean i i played the accordion so, some of what some of the accordion on the score is actually uh is samples and then i kind of twisted it up and added reverbs and delays and lo-fis and bit crushes and stuff just to make it sound kind of yeah. weird when it when it needed to but but there is some that's 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 acoustic accordion and um yeah yeah so that yeah, was fun it. it was very like uh leitmotif you know like we sort of sort of took bob's character and there were these moments that that it was like okay let, we're going to associate his character for this act or whatever with with the accordion you know so it was it was cool yeah. it, was a, it was a real fun fun score but uh you know, I, I think a lot of people hear the accordion or the banjo and they think, oh, it's an accordion banjo score. But it's funny because there's like, I mean, there's tons of different layers in, in, in any given cue. Um, we kind of took like traditional orchestra and uh, synth stuff and I built a bunch of synth patches and stuff for it just as like underlying soundscape and stuff too. So it was, it was fun. It was really eclectic. Really, really fun Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. And, and uh, has the soundtrack been released? It has. It, uh, it came out on the same day as the film. Fantastic. Is it going to get a vinyl release? Ooh, I'd uh, love to. I'd love to. Yeah. yeah. Put, put in your orders now. I'd, I'd, you know, if, if I can get to, if I can get to, uh, to a number that makes sense, I'd, I'd love to do it. Uh, I'd love to have one of those for my collection. Well, it's so great to have you all here. Sam, do you have a comedy background as well? Uh, I'm just curious because now, now I've just learned that everyone else does. Sure. <laughs> sure. So we're, all, we're all a bunch of fun guys and ladies here um you know i i have some questions that i want to just throw out for all of you but before i do that uh dw you know i didn't realize that uh your husband is the writer of too late uh so you know tell us about this guy this crazy guy who birthed this crazy film and, and where did the initial seeds come from what was the inspiration what was the spark that set this fire that is too late. Absolutely, yeah. Well, uh, Tom did stand up for a couple of years. And when we were first coming up with an idea, we wanted to do a horror because horror is obviously you can do it for pretty cheap and you can have a lot of fun doing it. And so we started coming up with different ideas. We wanted to have sort of 
a person feeding a monster and that idea sort of morphed into, well, we know Ron and we wanted to make a movie about Ron and we kind of used Ron's comedy show, his Tomorrow Show as, as a basis. And we thought, well, what a great place for like a monster to hide because, you know, he has his outward persona, but then behind the scenes, it's very, you know, dark and murky and, and people go missing and you'll never know. <laughs> and so just like he says, people come and people go. Um, and so we broke the story together and then Tom, Tom has one of those brains. He's kind of just like a, a, a genius brain, I think. <laughs> he, he has an encyclopedia memory and he just took it and wrote the script. I think he wrote the script in like three weeks. Um, mm. And we, we went back and forth and we, you know, of course, polished some things. And then we had to break it down and, and see if we could actually shoot it for the amount of money that we were able to raise. And then things changed here and there as they do with low budget. But um, really, I mean, really it's kind of a love letter to the comedy scene because it, it does have a lot of darkness, but also it has a lot of support and it has a lot of these stand-ups who are putting, putting themselves out there every night for audiences that sometimes really suck, you know, for coffee shops, for people that are doing something else, writing their own screenplays and have to, you know, leave or have to like put on their headphones while this comedy show is going on. And so we really love, I mean, I mean, that's like, it's fun and it's all about, coming up as a comedian and stand up. Yeah, um, it and must be tough. It must be tough. I, I even heard someone say one time, I don't remember who, but they said that comedians aren't really people. <laughs> oh, wait, it was in the movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and sometimes- Is that really how you feel when you're coming up? Oh, or was oh, no, that no, just no. how you're treated or? <laughs> I think that's how, uh, that's how you can be treated. And I think, um, sometimes comedians can be really intimidating because they use their life as fodder for their comedy, especially as being like someone who's dating or with a comedian, anything goes, you know? So in a way it's like, uh, I think sometimes it can feel like they're not really human, that they have <laughs> no, no heart. But of course that's coming from Bob and Bob is, uh, he's justifying his, his means of, yeah. of, of food source. Well, that, that definitely was a, a really fun line. All right, let, let me throw out some questions to, to all of you. I want to hear who, whoever's inspired to weigh in, weigh in. But this movie was such a brilliant hybrid of horror and comedy. Well, first of all, we talk about horror comedies a lot, but this is a, a comedy about stand-up comedy. So the comedy is like right in the forefront. What makes horror and comedy such wonderful allies? Why do, why do they go so well together? I think hmm. because with horror, you need to have a release and comedy is your perfect release because you can't just have constant horror, horror, horror. You need to like give the audience a, you know, a chance to breathe and comedy is a great way to do that. And it's also such a ridiculous concept, you know, with horror, you can have big monsters and, and it's inherently funny, I think. Right, there's a peppering of comedy in every horror movie, especially if it's like a really bloody, scary scene. You need that release that she's talking about. Um, or at least I do. I'm always looking for the comedy in a movie, so um, I don't get scared at all at horror movies. No, I'm not saying that. <laughs> uh, it's funny when you're coming up with an answer like this, you need to have an end to it before you get there. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I think from a from a scoring point of view, there's something that's really similar about scoring a, a comedy and scoring a horror in that you're mm. kind of building expectation to this moment, be it the the scare in, in, in a horror or the joke, right? And for right. both of them, you kind of you want to build expectation. And then when you get to this moment, either there's like there's a big musical moment that accompanies that that joke or that that scare or we kind of leave it blank and you let the, the let the joke or the the scare stand stand by itself and that was a really interesting thing in, in my mind when i was going along and, and like timing the score out was how 
how similar those two things really are. It, it was, it, it kind of shocked me to be perfectly honest. It's so true. That's a great point. It's really like set up punchline. It's the same thing. It's like yeah. me running around looking for Jimmy's set up punchline is like, you think he's going to be dead and he's there. I mean, that's very similar to joke structure. Yeah. Building people up, making them think one thing and then letting, letting them, you know, know something different. Totally. And like, and not to step on the joke musically too, right? Because that, that's the biggest thing we talk about in scoring comedy is you never want to step on the joke. You know, there can be music in the punchline, but let the punchline be the punchline, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And also, I think with, with horror and comedy, um, it, it can be more impactful from the wide, like comedy is always funnier from the wide is what they say, or from the long shot. And with, with horror, what we had to do, it wasn't quite the long shot, but we kind of had to leave the horror up to the imagination, which can also be very funny in its way. because you are left to imagine what's going on behind Violet as she feeds Bob, as he's slurping up his, his victim. And, and so I think in that it can be, yeah, it's a, it's a fine line. Let, let's let's uh, dwell in that area for a second because that's, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. And it's one of the things that I think I was talking about it during the tech check as well, where, uh, you know, the, the noises, the sounds that Bob makes when he's eating, it just like tickles the gag reflex, like so, so perfectly, you know, and it's almost because you can't see it, it, it makes the sound effects even more unnerving because it just sounds so gross. And Ron, were you actually making those noises yourself? Of course, they can't afford to have somebody else do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> we did use a lot uh, of your a lot of your sounds actually yeah i think there was a, a a section where i just made a lot of gross noises and uh the magic of sound editing <laughs> yeah, the, there's some the magic yeah. some, some like nauseating magic sounds. We What's that? To, you made about 20 minutes of gross sounds we had a lot to choose from it was <laughs> right it was fun. Right. And maybe you can release them all on a uh, collector's definitive collector's uh, Blu-ray on vinyl yeah. on the B side. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Let's make Bonus it happen, track. people. Come on, uh, Sam. I want to talk to you about the film's look because uh, you know comedy, horror comedy. These things like sound really bright. Uh, the film takes place. Uh, I'm sure I'm, there are a few scenes that take place during the day, but predominantly at night. You know. Uh, where Vi works, it's kind of this, you know, well-lit uh, coffee house, but the, the Hayworth where uh, Bob has his show is so dark, a very noir feeling, you know, uh, even when it's funny, the film feels so dark and, and a little bit gritty, you know, what were your inspirations for, for setting that kind of tone and palette? Um, I, Diana came to me with like a really awesome lookbook and I know, and like, I was just trying to remember kind of some of the I mean, like you, Gremlins was definitely on there. We sort of ran with like all these, well, it was fun. Cause like, I kind of thought for most of like pre-production that we were going to make like a very scary horror movie. And then, and like, that was sort of what a lot of the look was rooted in. And it, you know, it kind of became more of a romantic comedy like throughout it, which I think is awesome. Kind of like in this dark seedy underworld look. Um, but it, it, I mean, it's all, it's always fun. We just used a lot of like what we had around and, you know, you get to play with like, you know, really interesting, practical shas casting, like great shadows. And we had a really awesome gaffer who, who was a huge help with the lighting, which I think helped make the sets look so good. But, um, you know, I mean, kind of like just underbelly and like these kind of eighties, like, I know we talked about Halloween a lot and, and uh, everything that was like pretty kind of natural looking, we went a little bit theatrical with it kind of based in, in Bob's, uh, he was supposed to be kind of like this like um, ageless world traveler who knows all the different places he'd been kind of uh, like with the circus and like touring in Europe, you know, hundreds of years ago. So sort of like he, the theater that he kind of lived in was able to become this, uh, nice eclectic like really rich in texture more more of like a home than just like a backstage area 
which was super mm. fun. Yeah, it was great. The, the theater was was where the action happened, and it was his lair. You know, it was, yeah. uh, he, he was of the space. So. Really good stuff. Is is that a real theater in LA? We actually, well, the exterior is the Hayworth, which is down on downtown ish. But the interior was all uh, the Hungarian Cultural Center, which is downtown. And they pretty much, it was just like a warehouse. And there were like 15 rooms. And so we shot about. I don't know, I want to say 85% of the script at this one location. Oh, wow. Aside from, you know, yeah. It Sam, was Sam transformed uh, playing rooms into just insanely um, inspiring places to act. I have to say it that way. But I mean, the one room that I was in a lot, he had all kinds of uh, crap. And I mean that in the best way uh, from... Uh, like, every uh, period of time and all of, from all over the world so it was just an amazing i mean if i if i just did a 360 of the room I, my character was set in a way uh, nice. so i love sam's work i'm just saying that right up front yeah, no i'm saying it in the middle i'm saying it in the middle yeah I, yeah sam's really incredible because you know we did this in 15 days and i feel that a lot of that can be attributed to sam really transforming you know that's where the restaurant like the fact that one day we would be like in a club or a restaurant and then the next day it would be the scariest place in the world and that was just sam moving and changing things i mean yeah it was magic it really felt like all magic. of the same building <laughs> all the same building crazy yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, really built an entire world sam congratulations yeah. you know it's, it's great to to hear this because uh, you know, it, it did it looked perfect you know and you know i'm always amazed when you know i hear filmmakers reference their budget or the fact that they had only so much money uh, the film doesn't look like it, it's wanting for anything um it just looks great it looks fantastic so you know sam and and the gaffer and DW, uh, your your direction it came together really, really beautifully. Really good movie. Um, let, okay. Let's talk. I'm gonna, I'm, can, can I piggyback on that for yes, one? Yes, please. I, I just it, it just had a bell go off in my head. DW, how quickly did we we nail the tone of the score? Like version two or something? Yeah, I think, I think it was it, fast. It was pretty great. I think it has a yeah. lot. To, I think it has a lot to do with Sam. To be perfectly honest, it was really easy for me. I swear to God, man, I'm not. I'm not just blowing you up, but I gotta say, like, it really made it easy for me to get what the the tone of the thing was like immediately, and and I I don't know. It just it was like there were thing there were instruments there were like melodic and harmonic and rhythmic choices that I made that were like. I, it was like instantaneous almost. And, and I, I think now that I'm, now that I'm, you know, realizing it, I, I think it actually had, had quite a lot to do with, with said. And yeah. Based on those practical right. lights, because you had those great like vaudevillian type of look and then the practical lights when they would come in. I remember we talked about that, Michael, that um, you found great places for, for music to come in as those weird lights sort of came in. Right. And yeah, it was, yeah, I agree. Uh, it's so so much insight, you know. That's why I love having composers be part of these panels, because uh, you know your perspectives are so unique. And just hearing about how you you were, uh, took your cues from not only the director but from the 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 sets and the palette that Sam created is just a real testament to uh, the collaborative artistic process, where you know you feed on each other's wonderful efforts and end up producing something that's so much better than anyone could have done on their own. You know, I, I love collaborative work and. You know, it's so obvious that uh, uh, Too Late was a labor of love and you guys really loved what you were doing, really knocked it out of the park. Uh, we got some questions for you guys, but before that, I, I just kind of want to ask the, the comedians and all of you, you know, how do you think the pandemic is going to change the face of comedy? I mean, he, here's a, a movie about stand-up, uh, you know, and no stand-up has happened for the past uh, year and a half. So uh, is it going to... Is that just going to be a blip? Is stand up going to look like this again, you know, six months from now when we finally turn the corner? Or how do you see the scene evolving? How will it be the same or different? Uh, well, I just think it's going to be this. I'm just going to go back to being the way it was. I don't think there's really going to be much different about it. I mean, people will feel weird in the first few shows and it'll take a while to get back to it, but um, there's nothing to change. 
and there's nothing that will change really yeah uh, i i would even say maybe ron that would you agree that maybe the only thing that might change it might even be a positive thing like i've even felt there's just such a there's more energy in crowds now people are so excited to be back and laughing in person right. and, and it's it's almost like we're reminded of why we do it and audiences are reminded of like why they like it and it's it's almost like we're we're dancing it's like it's good you know things are i feel like it, same with live music i'm sure is experiencing a similar thing yeah yeah there's time like the there's timing 20s. with the con there's timing with the comics but the audience also has to get their timing together because <laughs> yeah. i've only i've only done a couple of shows but uh the audience doesn't it's not like an immediate laugh i think they they're thinking first or something you know because yeah, you when you're watching you something watch. online yeah. you don't have to express yourself so true so true yeah. now, let me ask you guys about like comedy content do you do you think uh, subject matters are going to be different now i mean uh, after we've all been through this pandemic uh, are, are different things funny or not funny it feels like there's been a, a kind of a cultural shift do, do you think that comedy is going to move in a new direction now, or are you already seeing that? Uh, what What do you think, Ron? You're shaking your head now. I don't. I don't know. I mean, I there's definitely going to be a lot of pandemic uh, jokes and comedy uh, that people are going to get tired of, and then that's <laughs> going to disappear, and people will get back to it. Um, yeah. I know. I had. I think I did a couple of things to do with the pandemic in my act only because the audience can relate to that you know you right. got to do something that's what they're relating to right now they're back uh and you got to talk about it a little bit yeah um, it's a crazy shared experience we have so yeah but i think mostly people are excited to laugh about other stuff i think i think to ron's point yeah people are probably excited to move past the pandemic and just laugh about other things yeah Right, right. I mean, uh, from my end, you know, I, I live in the world of horror and, you know, the one kind of horror movie no one wants to see right now is a horror movie about a pandemic because, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're, we're, trying, <laughs> we're uh, trying to watch a movie uh, to escape reality, not it. to get bogged down. So, yeah, I imagine it's going to be it's, kind it's, of the same thing for comedy. It's funny when you are like going through Netflix movies or something or looking at a bunch of movies online and you like hit on one and it's about um a virus <laughs> that's taken over the world or something and then there's tons of those you realize how many there are because of what we went through right uh, well, it's like anything what we else. went through yeah. it was also just a really popular popular uh, subgenre you know as somebody who's who's been watching horror for you know over a decade now a virus right. and and horror uh, that kind of a uh, uh, outbreak movie was uh, really really popular and i think that we're, we're going to see the end of that <laughs> Uh, post yeah, history. I remember at the beginning of the pandemic that that was like the top movie was um oh which one was it? I think it was Outbreak. Or Outbreak. Or one of them, yeah. And I was like, wow, people either they're taking this as hit, like actual information. They're like, oh, I will know all about the pandemic if I watch this, you know, Hollywood movie. Right. But yeah, it was weird. Wow, that's wild. Well, check it out. I, I have questions from the audience, uh, people who have been tuning in. So uh, let me let me go through some of these um, questions for y'all. Uh, DW, what was your conversation first like uh, with Michael when you were trying to find the right sound for the film? Yeah, so we we had actually had a composer before that couldn't hit the tone at all. And so we wanted to find something that was a little different that that wasn't all horror and it wasn't all comedy and it was kind of a nice blend and we also wanted to really pull out bob's uh bob's personality because he was kind of like the vaudevillian monster and he's been around for a long time and so i think our first chat was really about hitting that tone and we we knew michael could could use a lot of those instruments, like those interesting instruments that I don't even know the name of. You had a lot that you were playing with. <laughs> and and they were there were a lot of really cool sounds. And so he was able to kind of make this disjointed at times because Bob, his world is very disjointed and a little bit off. And and that was a big thing. We didn't want it super shiny. We wanted it to play with sort of the idea that this world is a little bit off. And um, yeah, and Michael kind of just nailed it. Like that first opening oh, opening piece, I remember he got it in like, yeah, it was like two versions. We were like, oh, this is perfect. 
and I just love how it gets gritty and it gets kind of pulls in all these different elements that take you the whole way through the movie. And, and I think I think Tom Tom talked about the Witches of Eastwick, uh, a couple of the themes from that. That's right. Which is a yeah. movie I hadn't thought about since I was eleven years old or something. Uh, and uh, yeah. And I, I dip back into the, the that soundtrack, which is a John Williams score, and it's kind of it's kind of a rare John Williams score. He doesn't usually go into that. I guess that's not true, but it, you know, it's not typically what I associate John Williams with. So it was there was sort of a goofiness about it to me, at least yeah. how, how I heard it. Like it was, I think maybe in the '80s when it came out, it was it was you know the, the language of film music in that time maybe was it, it might have seemed a little bit more scary. But to me, it was like kind of like cheesy and goofy and stuff. So I was kind of riffing off off that in a way. I mean, I didn't really use similar melodies or anything like that. But that was, I think, in terms of the opening cue, that was like some of the impetus behind behind where that cue came from. And then, and you know, that cue really, you know, it was kind of like a you know like an overture to 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 an opera in a way. Like within that cue, I kind of built the sound of, of, of the movie, you know, and then like kind of, we kind of like extracted different things from, from that cue throughout. So. Fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, Alyssa, here's a question for you. Uh, there's a scene where you're covered in a messy ooze. How long did you have to be covered in this during the filming? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we were, we were just chatting about this because we remember it was like midnight and it was, it was a really cold liquid is all I remember is it was, it was very cold and I was doused in it. I don't know, what would you, we, to give you guys, you, you made it happen really fast. I remember DW, we, we got me in and out pretty quickly into a shower, I remember. What would you say, like maybe yeah, a couple hours? I think it was fast, but I think it was probably a, a couple hours. Yeah. I, I definitely have photos, which I should post because it <laughs> is so funny. With, there were five people around you dumping <laughs> whatever it was. Petroleum jelly know. and like, yeah, yeah. yeah yeah, and you're just sitting there, frozen. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah. But that really, you're that whole scene speaks to, I feel very much you as a director and the trust I felt with everyone, you know, to get to the point where I was comfortable, you know, I don't want to say a spoiler, but doing that scene and being doused in this yeah. liquid, I just feel that you always made me feel really comfortable and uh, okay. So yeah, otherwise it could have been intense, yeah. Awesome, awesome. Uh, here's one for you, Michael. Uh, someone mentioning, uh, you know, picking up on the fact that you talked about accordion before using accordion in the film score isn't often done in horror movies. How, how did you decide on that sound? It, it's all because of the, the vaudeville association with, with Bob and, and this sort of um, nondescript, like, historical figure that, you know, and, and it's something actually DW and I and Tom talked about during the, the initial conversations too, is like, is Bob's backstory. And, and uh, you know, he, maybe he was from sort of like Baroque Europe to Victorian Europe, somewhere in that wide, wide gap of time and then sort of migrated around. Um, and, and, and the accordion to me, I mean, when, when we were talking about like this sort of mi migration, I, I initially like thought, oh man, like who, who's migrated around Europe for, the last thousand years or two thousand years, right? It's like gypsies and Jews, right? So it's like the the accordion to me is like a really is like a very klezmer like gypsy sort of instrument. Yeah. And then some of the melodies, like some melodies that come, I think in later, maybe like the second act or something like that. There's like um, a traditional Hungarian, oddly enough, that oh. <laughs> the Hungarians feel I didn't know there was one in the Hungarian Cultural Center. But there's this Hungarian uh, melody, this traditional called uh, uh, Bulgaresh. Um, and I was sort of riffing off that. It's like a harmonic minor thing. And uh, yeah, so that that kind of that's where that whole whole thing evolved, uh, you know, from it was very it was very organic in terms of like the conversations we had you know, influencing um, instrumentation, but also like harmony, melody, uh, rhythm, so. Well, I, I love the fact that uh, the instrument, cause yeah, you, you wouldn't think horror and accordion in a million years, but you, you chose an instrument that fit the character uh, on a historic level. You know, that's, that's some real uh, layered uh, creative stuff right there. So yeah, well, well done. Uh, Sam, uh, production wise, what was the most challenging scene for you to create? 
Um, they were all really challenging. Um, I I don't know. I think well, one one weekend Diana just reminded me of this actually. One weekend we had to like I had built all the sets in this Hungarian center that we filmed everything in, and um, it turns out that they rented the Hungarian center to a different. <laughs> over the weekend that we were supposed to have like dark days. So I had to like, you know, after our like 12 hour shoot day, like stay late, rip it all down and then come back for a pre-call like the next morning or, you know, like the Monday morning and and like put all these like thick, you know, 40 feet curtains up and- It's Bob's apartment. And, oh, and Bob's apartment. And it was, yeah, so the stage and Bob's apartment. Bob's apartment, wow. was little like trinkets from all the, you know, all over the world, basically. So, oh, and I put up wallpaper for that room too. Yeah, there was wallpaper. I wallpaper put it back up, so. You uh, know, it was, yeah. it was like, I mean, honestly, production on this thing was so like intense. And I'm like, I can't believe it was only 15 days when we were talking about it. Like, I think of it so it's just so like present in my mind. It was, it was one of those like very challenging, but like totally rewarding, like always going to be in my heart kind of thing. Well, it sounds like you were a Superman. I mean, you know, going above and beyond. <laughs> Not the only he was. Running he really, really was. It was insane. Yeah. No, it was, uh, I mean, it, it was everybody, you know, I'm like, but I appreciate it. You guys. Yeah, yeah, I love hearing these stories. It makes me just appreciate the film even more. I can't wait to watch it again and look e even more closely at all these wonderful details. Uh, Ron, got a question for you. Uh, where did you get the inspiration for evil Bob DeVore? Have you ever known anyone like Bob? Um, you know, a lot of times an actor will try to think of somebody and then pick that person and then try to like mimic a lot of the attitudes of that person. But um when you do comedy for as long as I have, uh, and I'm not going to tell you how long, um, you work a lot of road gigs and a lot of gigs in a club, a guy that owns a club, and he's in charge of that club, and you, he has the weirdest rules, and yet you still have to go out on a stage and make people laugh after he tells you a certain way of acting <laughs> before you go out. Anyway, there are some people that aren't that great in, in the business, and... Um, I don't think I thought of them specifically, but I know it was inspired by them. Um, I think I'll say that. Um, but I didn't think of anybody in particular. I just thought of like the worst me possible. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Uh, well, Rana, I mean, I love how you created such a unique character. Uh, there's so much about Bob that we don't know. And uh, just such a bizarre, bizarre character. Uh, Love him, love him for what he is. Uh, love him on the symbolic level. R really good stuff. Uh, another one for uh, DW here. Uh, got a Fred Armisen fan. Uh, how did he get involved in the film? Did you have a connection to him? Yeah, through Ron. So, so Ron actually, he he's known Fred for a long time. And when we were sort of trying to come up with, you know, whether we could throw someone in the movie that sort of had a name, that because definitely having having a few names helps you along the process, um, getting distribution and, and getting it out there so people can actually see it. And I think Ron, I think you mentioned like Fred Armisen and me and Tom were like, what? We, we could not, like he would never want to do this little film. And <laughs> you, you yeah. contacted him and he, he wanted to do it. So yeah, it was kind of amazing. I don't know if you have a longer story to that. Yeah, not really, he, he just owed me a favor. <laughs> um no i don't know what i'm saying um, sounds like bob <laughs> right yeah well i told him i would eat him if he didn't you know <laughs> of course he did uh, yeah um i was trying to taste i was trying to get him to play accordion on the score because i know he's a music guy but that didn't really pan out oh yeah oh, yeah 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 because yeah. yeah. he plays drums right he plays drums i did a show with him. i play drums too and i did a show with him and Four other like great drummers and we did a comedy thing, but it was all the show was just for drummers. And I think he has another show that's just musicians that he did in New York. Um, but uh, what a great idea. It was really fun. And um, yeah, I've known Fred for eons. That's all it was, you know, and he's he'll he'll basically do anything. I think I hope he's not watching this. 
<laughs> um, <laughs> all right. He's a great so guy. Fun, yeah, he's awesome. He's great. He was awesome. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, here's another one for Michael. Uh, did you have a, a favorite scene to score? And uh, they want to know if you give us a little example, either with the banjo or the keyboard you got in front of you. Ooh. A little I, live music I'm interlude. Good. I'm not good at favorite, favorite scenes. Um, that's a tough one. Um, I mean, I, you know, the, the final scene, I guess, was, was pretty iconic when, when, when uh violet like <laughs> jumps out through the stomach um yeah what else was a lot of fun i i thought all, all the like the quirky bob stuff was was really fun you know thinking about it a little more the 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 cue that we see all the pictures and you know of of bob yeah. was pretty cool we got to sort of play with with a couple of like you know more like modern to to sort of historical a lot of world building happens in a really short amount of time it was a great yeah, yeah. scene yeah that's really where we kind of get the get most of the backstory um yeah i mean i, I guess in terms of like in terms of thematic stuff I, I think that here let me see if i can get something uh get something up here there was this uh where are we How how audible are we here? Quite audible. Pretty low. Is it low? Should I bring it up? Yeah, bring it up. crank it. Okay, cool. Let's see how we do. Like th this was a theme that, that kind of happened throughout. Um, right, that that little melodic fragment happened throughout on the on the harpsichord, um, you know, an accordion and like various various iterations um like that that sort of stuff too that that you know so the way i kind of viewed this is there's there's like these little melodic cells and those were almost those almost became the theme we didn't really have a blown out like long theme throughout this 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 film um but you know this whole this whole scale of like Right, that that scale is like it. There's a certain kind of nostalgia, I think, that comes. Yeah, from. yeah. It instantly has this like old world feel. Right. There's something the so European, exactly. Hammer yeah. horror esque about it. Yeah, exactly, uh, exactly. Yeah. So like, so oh, oh, and by the way, for whatever reason, now I have all this like this delay and reverb and stuff on the. Uh, here, let me. So you know, in terms of like the 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 dry sound, we would say, you know, in, in terms of like how we how I started off with the accordion sound, it would sound probably close. Right, it would sound closer to that at, sort of at the start of the film. And then as we like got further down, here, I'll throw this stuff back on. Right, it would be kind of like that. So we like throwing on delays and all this sort of weird, weird, uh, Hang on, let's get this. Yeah, as things become more surreal. Like, sort of like backwards, like weird garbly sort of. Yeah, look. as as the film becomes more nightmarish. God, I love the fact that you're uh, able to just show us by example here. Really special and something we'd never be able to do at a standard panel. So, you know, good things do come from uh, the, the Zoom uh, adventure we've all been on. Uh, during the pandemic thank you so that much that evoked for a little uh d'argento to me absolutely uh, yeah. Right. yeah 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 really know. fantastic thanks so much for sharing composers are people too you know <laughs> <laughs> it really perfectly is like ron because you know there's like the quirky element and the sort of fun vaudevillian but then there's like a real daunting element to that music too it, it blends those two perfectly yeah, it's awesome. There's something about like the pluck of the accordion too. Yes. That's like, it's really sharp. Yes. So it, it lends itself, I think, really well to, to comedy. You know, you well, know, the sort of like more traditional like comedy scoring, I guess that's, you know, it's it's kind of arcane at this point, but like the like ch cello and like, you know, pizzicato strings, like the did, 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 like that really sharp, you know, sharpness that that's something that's something that I was trying to find a way to to communicate that sharpness without using that sound. 
So mm. we were sort of fig trying to figure out like what what's an instrument that can have that that character to it that also can tie to to Bob's character and 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 be more like organic and of the film. Yeah. Yeah. Well, fantastic. Thanks so much for, uh, for giving us that, those, those live samples. There. It, was, it was amazing. Uh, got one for Alyssa and Ron. Uh, how close to the script did you guys stick or uh, did you guys stick to the script or was there, were there improvisational moments? I don't remember. <laughs> uh, um. To Tom's amazing script and then DW really created an environment that was like feel free to be loose and have moments so I do feel like we had a nice blend where we always got one that was tight to the script but then there were always opportunities to like react and play around and riff a little bit since we we were working with ex pretty much 100% of the cast I want to say was comedians so it was so fun because everyone was like so talented and funny that it was we could kind of have fun riffing together. And then it was such a short script because I know as the editor, um, I got to see all of the once again after, you know, being on set and then coming back and editing, going through it all. Um, we actually, you, you did stick pretty close to the script for a lot of it. And yeah. I think the, with you and Jenny, you and Jenny had such great chemistry and a lot of that fun improv came out of there. Totally. But um, yeah, it was pretty close. Most of it was close. close. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, um, Ron just went completely off script and decided to uh, <laughs> <laughs> pop out for a second. He's coming back. Those of you watching this, the stream, you're you're experiencing a technical hiccup. Do not panic. We will recalibrate. Welcome back, Ron. You're muted. Click that microphone icon, and you'll be back 100%. Ron. Microphone icon. <laughs> My audio. There That's you go. So funny because I said something as a joke and it was not heard. Yeah, was not, Zoom decided perfect. it wasn't that good. Zoom, yes. the, the Zoom gods were like, not funny, Ron. You just gotta, <laughs> gotta get you out of here for well, a second. I'll have to send over to DW to say what, how much we had lib because I think we did a little bit, but not, not much. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because we only had like one or two takes per scene. Um, I think that is one thing you get from like doing a, a, a comedy with a bigger budget is you really have the time to play and to really let your your cast go. But because they were all trained comedians, you know, they were able to button the jokes and button the lines really well. Um, yeah, I think if you make a choice to ad lib or improv, um, I think you only make that choice if it's really good. So true. In a script like this. Yeah. yeah. So true. Right, right. Well, it was an amazing script. It was funny as hell and, you know, just wonderful from start to finish. Um, of course, we have a, a Bob's Burgers fan popping up here. I, I thought it might happen. Ron, you, you play a character uh, named Ron in Bob's Burgers. Uh, well what's your favorite part of yeah absolutely even kind of a bit of a resemblance mustachioed uh <laughs> tall mustachioed fellow uh, what's your the favorite part hair. of being about what's your favorite part about being on bob's burgers uh the money <laughs> um they've been slowly using me less and less so i would like fans to write into the bob's burgers people and say you demand more ron we we but, demand uh, more ron we're gonna start a hashtag and uh <laughs> get ron in on some more action you just did the movie uh there's a movie coming out i don't even know if i can talk about it but well um, you just did awesome. well i did but who cares um I only had like three or four lines, but they put every character in. They put everybody in. It's pretty great. Well, are, um, are you surprised that, with, that the show has really become sort of a cultural phenomenon? Yeah, no, I mean, I'm not really. I mean, you know, I've worked with those same people for a long time. I started with Dr. Katz, and they, it's kind of the same production people a little bit. And um, the fact that now it's a, it's a, it's a uh, primetime show, so you can't, speaking of improvising you can't improvise as much uh but you still do on that and, and the producer will let that happen because quite often the, a magic happens and also you're also recording with uh five other people that are on the cartoon with you so there is some kind of magic that may happen uh, comedy wise uh, well, of course really during the pandemic i was doing it at home but um 
Yeah, no, I, I love doing that show in spite of what I said. Right on. Right. Really fun show. Got some good I, Halloween episodes I, that uh, us horror fans are fond of as well. So uh, yeah, I, I wish you yeah. success in that as well. Yeah, this you. has been a really fun time and, and the hour is almost completely over, but you know, I'm not going to wrap up before I give everyone a chance to talk about what they're working on next. Uh, start with you, DW. Uh, you got some, some new, something new in the works or you're still just in too late mode. Yeah, well, we are still sort of finishing up too late, but we've got two, uh, two more creature features that, um, that I want to start pushing forward and, yeah, kind of finding the next move, looking for investors and, you know, putting ourselves out there and hopefully we can have a bigger budget and go really deep into the practical effects and get Mo Meinhardt, who did the who did the creature effects. And I, I do actually want to bring her up because she did a terrific job. Get her and, ha- and go further. Oh, you know? absolutely. Uh, that's music to my ears, DW, because, uh, you know, I feel like you're just getting started in the horror sphere and, and a lot, lot more space uh-huh. for you to work out there. So uh, you definitely have to keep us in the loop because uh, whatever, you, whatever you're doing next, want to be able to let our readers know and uh yeah help you out any way we can so fantastic fantastic uh ron what are you working on these days you got your tomorrow show what else i'd like to say uh something first i'd like to uh point out that the uh the cinematographer uh was amazing and uh we didn't talk about him at all uh but uh we had a great cinematographer as well period um great job yeah I'm still doing the tomorrow show. I don't know where it'll be um, a month from now, but uh, we're doing it on IG right now uh, at Ron Lynch One. And uh, that's a variety show. And uh, whatever fits into the tiny screen, we do it on the phone. We don't like this Zoom thing is horrible. Uh, I'm kidding. And um, we do it on a a tiny uh, IG TV on the phone. So um, tune into that. And what else do I have going on? Not a lot. (laughs) <laughs> Fantastic. Hey, uh, uh, don't want to give anything away, but if there was a sequel, would you want to come back and, and do Bob DeBoer again? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No. Yeah. Oh, no, yes, I would. <laughs> I would of course. Are you kidding me? They have to be the same people I'm working with. I'm not going to well, work with anyone. Well, of course. Anybody. I mean, this is, this is the magic team right here. Fantastic. Uh, Sam, what are you working on these days out in Arizona? Selling cannabis products. Got yeah. Delta 8 oils. We've got cartridges and tinctures. And it's a, it's a really great sweet spot for a lot of people with, uh, you know, looking for a daytime high, who have THC sensitivities, or need like really intense pain management. Right on, right on. I'm kind of laughing, not because of anything you said. There's a guy who goes down my street uh, a few times a week selling tamales, uh, announcing it in a loudspeaker. You're probably going to hear it in a second. <laughs> He's about to roll by my house. That's why I'm kind of cracking up because, you know, live, what are you going to do about it? Well, that's fantastic, Sam. You know, uh, definitely want to know uh, when you're working on another horror movie, but you and I can connect and talk more about cannabis. You know, a bit of a connoisseur. You know, might want to learn more about what you got going on. We're sure we're glad to have you here tonight. Uh, Alyssa, what are you doing these days? Yes, so a scripted podcast that I am in just came out. It's called Edith. It stars Rosamund Pike, and it's on Q Code Media and Crooked Media. It's really funny. Um, it's, yeah, it's fun. It was, it was a lot of fun to do. So that is out on, like, iTunes and Spotify and all that. Excellent. Uh, would you do another horror movie if the opportunity came up? I would do another horror movie and I would truly do anything with anyone who worked on this movie. It was like an amazing experience and to be able to work with anyone again would be a true honor for sure. Yeah, yeah. And we're gonna to get see. you back here, Sam. I'm yeah, you're yeah, you enjoy Arizona, buddy, because we're taking you back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, you, you need to get the band back together. Mm-hmm. Do it for the fans. Uh Michael, yeah. what are you working on these days? Uh I am I'm, I have already pre-scored the sequel to Too Late. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Oh, I'm not allowed to talk. Uh. About it. <laughs> uh, no, I'm on. Uh, I'm on a, a rom-com right now, and then uh, another one in in August. So that's my sort of 
uh, film scoring stuff at the moment, but I, I'm also sort of dreaming up a, a longer, uh, like 20, 25 minute orchestral uh, piece of music, just music for music's sake. So Fantastic. It's good to do that too from time to time. Yeah. Music yeah. for music's sake. Uh, it's screen. been so great to, to have all of you here. I wanted to give uh, DW some final words before we, we end our, our live broadcast. But is there anything else anyone wants to say before I wrap things up? Check Just out two, oh, go ahead. Just to thanks no? so much for having us. You're oh, so great. Such please. A fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were great. You were great. You guys, you guys. Things good and you did a great job. It's really, yeah, it's really fun. Thank you. Well, you guys uh, make it easy. Too Late is out now. A horror comedy that's pretty dang unique. Breath of fresh air, something you're going to want to see. Uh, DW, before we wrap things up, do you have any final words about the film, why people should be excited to check it out? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a really, like you said, a really unique, fun film, and it showcases a lot of talent, and go see it. It's it's online. It's in, I think it's in a couple theaters still, but uh, you can find it anywhere where you rent or buy movies. Yeah, thank you so Ooh. much. We've been talking about Too Late, available to stream now. One of the most surprising horror films I've seen in 2021. I think people should see it, and I think when they do, they're going to be talking about it. I want to thank all of my guests for being here tonight. Uh, giving us their time. I want to thank everyone for tuning in. I want to thank my team at Dread Central for supporting us on the tech side. It's been an absolute blast. Join us again on another episode of Dissecting Horror. Until then, uh, panelists, stick around for a second. Everyone else, good night. We'll see you. Love you guys. Bye. Bye. Did you guys know you can do a bunch of yoga and still be an asshole? <laughs> you comic? No, this is just something I'm working on. Uh, aren't we all working on something? Fredo. Huh? I asked for a Miss Blue. Do you want me to look like a corpse up here? Yeah, I'll pretend I care. You're violent, right? Is this your show? Yeah, it's my show. I'm a booker. Well, you're Bob Divorce's assistant. So you booked too late, right? That job is your whole life. He's never gonna let you go.